Hi, welcome to Community Fellowship Church in Lancaster, PA. We're so glad you're joining us on our live stream today. You can find us here every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. Our service begins in just a few minutes. If this is your first time tuning in, we'd love to connect with you. Click on the link in our YouTube description and fill out our connection card to let us know you're here. Ask any questions you may have and let us know how we can be praying for you. If you would like to find out more about CFC, visit our website, communityfellowship.com. Here you can find out about our mission as a church, download weekly lessons and videos for kids in preschool through fourth grade, connect with the student community for grades five and up, find out about upcoming events, getting connected with a community group, and so much more. We are active on Instagram and Facebook. You can follow us at facebook.com slash cfclancaster, and our Instagram handle is at cfclancaster. If you are a regular attender of CFC or CFC Livestream, be sure to download our Alexio Community app to receive our weekly email updates, access our online directory, or give to the mission of CFC. If today's service is a blessing to you, please consider sharing it with your family and friends. You can also click the subscribe button click the bell, you'll be notified the next time we are live on YouTube. Thanks again for joining us today. CFC is going to be with you tonight. If you're uh, new, my name is Dan, and uh, this is our team. This is Abby and Brayden and Jasmine. We're going to be leading you with uh, with our with our band together. So let's stand and worship. Let's stand and worship together, church, and welcome online. We're glad you're joining us online to participate in worship. Let's sing together.
always at work. God, we thank you that we can gather as a church and worship you, God, and give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this time we thought it'd be great to just spend a minute to uh, just read God's word together. So we're going to read this verse um, together. Um, it says, to you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord, I plead for mercy. Is there in my death, if I go down to the pit, with the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. search the
thank you for that life, God, that we can declare we have in you. God, we thank you. God, just for your goodness, God, for your mercy is new every day. God, we worship you. We sing these songs, God, for you, to you. God, may you just be glorified and honored. Lord, in Jesus' name, all God's people said together, amen, amen. Well, thanks for worshiping with us this evening, church. Uh, before you grab a seat, please just say hi to someone around you and just introduce yourself to someone new tonight. I'm Jason, the executive pastor here at Community Fellowship Church. If you're checking us out for the first time, welcome. We're glad you're here joining us. And if you're new and here in person today, please stop by our welcome desk on your way out. We have a gift for you. So men, God calls us to invest in the lives of other men. And so we would ask you to join us for the CFC Men's Breakfast, Saturday, February 13th. We'll be discussing the importance of mentorship and how you can get connected with CFC Men's Ministry and their mentoring program. You can register for that breakfast at communityfellowship.com. So as followers of Jesus, we use the gifts that God has given us to serve others and to bring glory to Him. So each year, we give you all opportunities to say, I'm in, and to volunteer at CFC. But like so many other things in this crazy world, that campaign was put on hold. So however, if you are ready to be back in, uh, then we're ready for you and we have a wide array of volunteer opportunities. So on your seat, you will find a guide that lists our volunteer positions as well as an interest card. And you can fill that out, drop it in the basket, and we will be in contact with you. If you're joining us from home, you can find the same information and the interest card at our website by clicking I'm back in at communityfellowship.com or by clicking on the volunteer link at our homepage. So lastly, if you would like to support the mission and the vision of CFC financially, you can do so by using the offering boxes on your way out and on our website or by using our Alexio app. All right. Well, thank you. That was Jason, and uh, he's our executive pastor. I'm Pastor Bobby, if you're just visiting. And um, we're excited uh, to be working our way through the Gospel of Matthew in a, in, in a time where cultural voices are so loud. It's so wonderful to be able to have a a scriptural view, a biblical view, and to understand what is God's heart and how can we kind of sift through these things. A couple of things I want to mention before we get into Matthew 25. Jason just mentioned the idea of being back in. And so, like he said, whether you're here in the room or whether you're watching online, um, you can either take one of these cards with you or go to our website. The, our goal for the month of February is to see if we can have... Um, 40 new volunteers join us. Um, uh, there, are, there are several uh, places that you can do that. And it, it, just in order to um, have one service that we offer to people, there are a lot of volunteers and a lot of things behind the scenes. And what we like to do is to spread out um, the, the opportunities uh, among a lot of people so not just a few people are carrying a load. And I know with uh, COVID having hit, it kind of put a halt on things. But uh, we're going to be moving forward. We're going to be updating you a little bit, moving the dial a little bit on some of our masking policies. And we're going to uh, start begin moving a little more in the direction uh, to challenge you a little bit to consider being back in. And so, like I said, our goal will be 40 of these cards. On the back, it actually says, um, I can start serving now or I could start um, in March or April. And so if, if you want to fill one of those out, like I said, our goal is 40 of these because sometimes when you make a public announcement, people will say, oh, great, they're announcing publicly. Many people will respond, and then nobody will respond. But if you, just, if you could pray about it and, and just personally consider what uh, implication that has, and if you could be a part of that, that would be wonderful. The second thing I wanted to mention, especially for those of you watching online, that we're going to be taking communion here uh, uh, towards the end. And so if you want to uh, grab uh, some bread and juice, uh, whatever you want to do as a, uh, to represent those elements, you can be ready for that. Uh, that will be taking place here soon. So we are in uh, the middle of a sub-series in Matthew called The Clash of Kingdoms. And whenever you see God coming closer to the world that he created, uh, there's going to be tension. There's going to be an increase in a clash. 
And we're going to see that uh, play itself out uh, through the Passion Week. And uh, the, sp the specific question that is asked Jesus, though, in, for chapters 24 and 25 is, tell us what will be the signs of the end, and then uh, when will this happen? And so we talked about the signs of the end that really link up very well with the, the tribulation period, that last seven-year period. Um, Jesus references um, the, the prophecy of Daniel, and that's why we know he's talking about that time of Jacob's trouble, that last seven-year period. And we walked through that. What are the signs going to be? Unbelievable signs. Uh, the stars falling from the sky. It's going to be like so uh, much greater than anything we've ever experienced. But there are certain birth pangs that lead up to that. And so he talks a little bit about that. But then we shifted gears to, in the last two sessions that we had, about the, question, the second question, when will this be? And everybody's on the edge of their seat. When is this going to happen? And then the answer comes, no man knows the day or the hour, and you're like, ah. Oh. But then four times, watch and be ready. Watch and be ready. It's going to be like in the days of Noah, where everybody's kind of doing their own thing. They're not really expecting it. And then, boom, like a thief in the night, the return of Christ. Kind of like the rapture of the church. One will be, two will be in the fields. One will be taken. One will be left. Uh, two will be, they'll be working at the mill. You know, one will be taken. One will be left. And it'll be, there's a suddenness that's there about the return of Christ. And then the question comes in, am I ready for the return of Christ? Like, am I ready uh, to have Christ return at any moment? And what will that look like? So the big idea today is Jesus is going to use another story to represent the idea of being ready. And today we want to look a little bit at this idea of the awe of production. The awe, the awe of production. The, we're going to uh, walk into a little bit of the idea of the signs of having the fruit of the Spirit um, in you and being able to invest in the kingdom of heaven. And that someone who is anticipating and ready for the return of Christ is someone who is already uh, uh, bearing fruit. There are signs and there's the excitement of things that we can produce now that will have an implication for, for eternity. Um, this, this concept, the awe of production or investing now for uh, something that is going to be produced down the road, uh, is, is, is challenging for some of us because um, I don't know how it was when you started out early in life and someone said to you, you should invest now for retirement. <laughs> you guys, some of you are young and you're like, yeah, I know. When Jen and I got married, I was making like, I think, 35000 We were missionaries going overseas. And, and, and people are like, hey, you should, uh, you should consider investing for your future retirement. And so to carve out $100 a month or whatever was like, oh, I don't want to do that right now, but I'm going, to, I'm going to go for it. And then every year as you watch the statement, you're like, whoa, th this is growing more and more. And there's this excitement. You pull out the statement, you're like, this is pretty cool. And so there was an investment over here that was a sacrifice, but there's the excitement of where that goes. And so when we're talking about eternal things, we're not talking about our stock market. <laughs> we're talking about like very real investment that is going to pay off down the road. What is the sentiment that goes with it? So if you're like me, I, I kind of wrestle with some of the sentiment. First of all, sometimes you and I can say, I don't feel very productive for God. Like, sometimes we, we try to do something and we don't see immediate results and we don't feel that productive and it can be discouraging. For some of us, we might go as far to say, what I do, like, what I, the, the things that I do won't really make that much of a difference on the grand scale of things, right? And then some people will say, um, I, I don't tend to want to take risks for God or do something that's too out there because I'd rather just play it safe. <laughs> and so we, we kind of have our, our own inner dialogue of why we don't take risks and invest in God's kingdom, right? So that's a little bit of how some of us feel. And so this story about readiness, the return of Christ, I don't want to regret that, oh, I missed all these opportunities. I was asleep. I was distracted. I, like, I really, really want to be ready and excited for his return because I've been investing, right? And so that's why I think Jesus shares this story of the talents 
uh, in order to help us. This is the feel of what it's like when you're just anticipating the return of Christ and you don't want to have regrets, right? So in verse 14, he starts out with this simple idea of the journey. There's the master goes on a journey, right? It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. So the owner is on this journey and he seems to be gone. And the question is, where is he? And last week we talked about the delay factor, right? He's delayed and that's with the the church, um, the anointed one was cut off. There's this delay now called the church age and you're like, where is the master? Where's the master? And he's on this, this journey. With the servants, we find out there are various servants in the same way that last week there were a variety of bridesmaids. There were five who had oil and five who didn't, right? Now, some people would say that um, there's something wrong with the church, right? Something is wrong with the church. And I think Jesus would say the same thing back then. There's something going on with people who are part of the kingdom in heaven and those who aren't. It's really a mixed bag that the church is actually filled with a mixture of people. So the way it breaks down, five virgins have oil, five don't. Or when the nets are collected, there's a separation of the good and bad. Or the soil, you plant the seed and it begins to grow, but because it had no roots, it didn't bear fruit. Or the separation of the wheat and the tares. The tares look like wheat, but there's a separation. So all are part of the group, but not all are really born again. Does that make sense? So there's this dynamic that Jesus is bringing out when it comes to being ready is you could say, I'm part of the wedding party. Like, I'm part of the group. I'm one of the servants. But you find out in the story that not all are really part of the group. You will know them by their fruit is what he says in Matthew chapter 7. So you have the servants and then they are entrusted. This word entrusted, right? It's th- so this is a simple uh, lesson on stewardship, the idea that I'm not an owner, but I've been entrusted with a certain amount of resources. It's very, fairly basic, but uh, in our culture here in the United States, um, we can very quickly say um, what's mine is mine. Um, I earned that paycheck. That's mine. But there's this idea here that actually you're not the owner. You've been entrusted with something. If you take it to the next level as a nation, I believe that we have been arrogant as a nation. I believe that we've seen ourselves as the owners of the blessings we have. Um, we prayed the other night that we've actually murdered babies in this country through abortion. Um, we have not made disciples of others, but we have sort of reveled in our material things and we've sort of lived for pleasure and happiness. And so. The church is mixed in with this culture, and it affects us as a church. And then you add to that then the Christian prosperity gospel that has nuances in it of what's really in it for me. If you really want to follow Christ, then follow him, because when you're following him, there's, there's your Mercedes right there. I mean, you're going to have the bigger house and the, the bigger pool and the better. And so there's these things that have filtrated themselves down into the church through the prosperity gospel, very much of this is mine, right? And that I'm the end of this. I'm sort of the nucleus of God's kingdom. Whereas the Christian gospel is much more deny yourself, take up a cross, be willing to follow me. And so instead of saying what's in it for me, we're saying what's in it for the king because he knows what's best. And so I struggle with this, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm kind of in and out. Like um, in October, I went to visit my brother and, uh, in Florida, and I thought, this is going to be so much fun. I struggle, like, I do my work, and then when I have time off, then it's, this is my time. Do you ever, guys ever feel that way? <laughs> and so I struggle, it's not really my time. This is also still God's time. So I'm, I'm going to visit my brother in Florida, and so I, I rent a car down there, um, and, uh, and then he and I can, can drive around and enjoy some of the time together. So for hardly any more money, they had this thing going where you could, you could actually get a convertible if you want. And I'm like, Florida, convertible, <laughs> you know, I'm in. And I got to admit to you, like, I got a little bit, like, too much on this is my time, this is my, to have fun, and, like, all this different stuff. And so my brother and I were swimming in the waves at one point, and a wave, this massive wave came, took me up. I face-planted underwater, cracked my neck and my back, and I can just remember thinking, thank God I'm not paralyzed right now. And it was just like a sobering wake up, like 
dude, you're not your own <laughs> with your little convertible over there. <laughs> and I don't think God is like, it says you can't have fun or whatever. But for me, it was just a wake-up call. Like, you, you need to remember he owns it all, right? And so um, we're talking about the idea of what we've been entrusted, what God has entrusted to us, and um, that that's the context of this readiness for him to return. Okay, let's look at verse 15 and the idea of distribution and investment. So, to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. And then he went away. Um, he who had received five talents went at once and he traded them, so there's no hesitation there. Um, he made five talents more, and, and the one who had two talents made two talents more. But he who just received one talent went and dug in the ground a, a hole and he hid his master's money. So, let's just talk about this briefly. Uh, what are the talents, right? I'm kind of curious. What, what are the talents? What is being distributed? Is it like, oh, you're really talented. You're, a, you're good at drums, or you're a good communicator, or, or, or you're a good mechanic. Is, is that the talents that God has distributed? <laughs> a, a talent is actually a Greek numerical form of currency. Um, and so um, it would be like a weight or a measurement of an amount of money like gold or silver. So it's thought that it was probably a talent back then would have been um, uh, about 80 pounds worth of silver, which would have been about 6,000 denarii. A denarii is a day's wage. So about 15 years worth of wages would be a talent. A lot of money. <laughs> so <laughs> I've given you one, 15 years worth of wages to invest or 75 years worth of wages to invest. That's a lot. So we could take this strictly as an economics lesson. There's a physical lesson. But I think you could even take it to the next level that there's a spiritual lesson about the talents being divine opportunities, uh, maybe spiritual gifts and other things that God has given you to invest, um, supernatural abilities, the fruits of God's Spirit, and so then the question is, what is the level of your ability in that? Uh, you've been given five, you've been given two, you've been given one, and what is your level of ability? And, the, and the, the phrase here, each according to their ability. So if you have more ability, then you ha get more talents to invest. If, if, if God created you with more abilities, then you just have more talents to invest. So I, I thought it was so funny, R.C. Sproul, used this in one of his sermons to say Jesus is a capitalist. <laughs> Not all equal distribution. Uh, it, it, different abilities, different investments. Now, capitalism is not as popular today anymore. Um, I, I love capitalism. But I would submit to you that when Christians view God's resources as their own, and we start to get greedy, like the prosperity gospel, um, then capitalism gets mixed in sort of with Christianity, and all of a sudden the rest of the world begins to judge. It, the goal, I don't think Jesus is a strictly a capitalist. I think there's, there's some capitalism in there, but the goal is not for private property, right, and for greed and how much I can have. That would be strict capitalism. The goal that Christ shows is production, the awe of production, and some people have more ability, they should be entrusted with more. And some people think if you have a lot, oh, you have it good. No, it sucks to have a lot because <laughs> you're responsible for it then, right? Isn't that interesting? I, I, I'm not saying it's a terrible thing to have a lot. I'm just saying there's a dynamic there that to whom much is given, much is required. And so to be entrusted with much can be burdensome, and it's not equal distribution, but each according to their ability in a context of stewardship. Okay, a second piece to that, each according to their ability, is um, do any of you ever compare yourselves with others and then get discouraged? <laughs> My wife and I were talking about this the other day. She's like, why does it seem like other people can handle more stress than I can? You know? <laughs> or why does it seem that given a scenario, someone else has a better answer? Why didn't I think of that? And so, and so the, a great answer is, just thank God that you're a little stupid because you're not as responsible then. God doesn't hold you as responsible. And it's like, why am I so worried and comparing myself with others? God distributes each according to their ability. If you don't have the ability, he's not going to require as much from you. So don't compare yourself with others. Each according to their ability. 
It's kind of good to be a little stupid sometimes. Let's talk about the investment. They traded. They were excited to go and trade. This is sort of the, the awe of production. I get to produce. So the most important single ingredient um, to help other humans is production. Let's just take from a purely physical point of view. Remember Henry Ford? I've only heard of him. Some of you might remember him. Um, he, um, he single-handedly brought the price of an automobile down to where the common person could own one, right? Pure production. It, just a great example of how wonderful and what a blessing it is when there is production. Um, the concern in the United States is the rapid decline of production in our country. It's like, hey, that's not a good idea. And then I can remember when I was in Russia, before the Iron Curtain came down, we got to go uh, into, into the Soviet Union with a music team. It was, it was a weird experience to be in Russia when it was still Soviet communist. And I can remember driving, and we would see certain fields. Hello. <laughs> We would see certain fields, and they, were, they would drop off like a truckload of like 20 babushkas <laughs> at, on the edge of a field to start harvesting or to treat um, the field in some way. And I thought, this is so strange that they don't have big machinery, and they don't have a lot that's in, been invested in the production of this. And um, why is there such a lack of profitability? Because nobody invested in the production. And so the Bible on every page um, is concerned for our physical well-being and for the idea of being in an environment where we can produce, where we can be creative and where we can produce. So just, just from a strictly a physical uh, point of view, the idea of trade, they defer their own gratification as good stewards and they live within their means and they took risks and invested and utilized their resources to create more resources. That's built into God's kingdom. And it's, it's a physical example here. It has some spiritual implications. So the goal of production, what is God actually looking for? The physical implication, um, if you have prosperity and can produce well, then you have food to, to feed people. You have medical resources. And Isaiah 61 goes into this a little bit. Bind up the brokenhearted um, Comfort the fatherless, set at liberty the captives, and proclaim the gospel to the poor. This is a, a verse in the Old Testament that is actually mixed with physical and spiritual blessing. Okay? So God cares about being a healer. God cares about poverty. God cares about the physical needs, but also the spiritual needs. And he takes it to the next level in the New Testament in Mark 16, to go into all the world and preach the good news. Right? So to share the gospel with other people, because the ultimate need that people have is, is their spiritual needs need to be met for eternity, okay? So we have today a physical example of investing in talents, and there's a certain um, level of understanding of just the physical idea of the awe of production, okay? And then we have the idea of um, the spiritual investment. So the main differentiation in our passage, though, is will this give me what I want? as one of the servants? Or will this help other people to ultimately know Christ? And so you see the, the investors with the five and the two, and you see the one who didn't invest anything. So I want to, let's focus in briefly on the guy who received five and the guy who received two, all right? The awe of production in verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with him. So I believe that's the rapture of the church, the return of Christ. He who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more. Wow, he doubled. He doubled um, the profit. Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I've made five more. And so his master says, well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Verse 22. He also went to the guy who had the two, and he said, come forward, Master, you delivered to me two talents here. I have made two more. And his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Same thing he says to both, right? How exciting when the master comes, and I get to bring to him what has been produced, the awe of production, that God would invite me into this process, he would entrust me with something, and I can be a part of multiplying out 
the blessing. What I think is pretty cool here is that both of them doubled what they had. The one brings four units and the other ten. You notice how much more the other one brought? But that doesn't matter to God. God is not looking at who brings more. What God is saying is, did you take risks and invest with what you had, right? Don't get discouraged and compare yourself with the guy who who produced ten units. Just look at what you have and are you producing or are you and taking risks or are you just playing it safe? What did you do with what you had? Was there an effort made? And then, if you can imagine, there's, an, a, there's a divine appointment that you are going to have before God. If you're a believer, you're going to stand before God, and you're going to hear this verbal affirmation, well done, you good and faithful servant. Can, can you see that moment? Can, can you see yourself standing there and the excitement as God looks and said, man, you have responded to what I gave you, what I entrusted to you, well done. That's exciting. He looks at you, and he's aware of what you've done. And do you notice this? It's different for the one with the five than for the two. You know what that tells me? It's very personal to everyone. It's very personal. You will have a personal encounter with God. It's not this big mass thing where God looks at the masses. He looks at you. He's going to look you in the eye and say to you, I saw everything that you did. Well done. You were faithful over a little. I saw when you rocked the baby to sleep and you were tired. I saw when you chose not to go to the movies, but instead to give to charity. I saw when you helped wash the dishes. I saw when you forgave someone else who hurt you. I saw when you prayed for your neighbor. I saw when you shared your faith. I saw you cook a meal for a single mom. I saw you hand cash to someone who was in need. And, and it could go on and on. And God is looking at that. And he's saying, I, I see you. In, in our next passage next week, it's actually, when did I do all this? And it said, when did I, I give a cup of water? When you gave a cup of water to this little one, you gave it to me, right? And every little act of service is somehow recorded there. Um, if you have the Spirit of God in you, then God is moving you to do these things. There, there's a book out by Keller where he describes, Tim Keller describes um, this British guy, Niggle is his name. <laughs> and um, the story of Niggle is that he was an artist and he was painting a canvas of this huge um, tree with all these leaves. And Niggle got so stuck painting in perfection um, a leaf that it slowed down the process of him getting this project done. And then every time that he would go back to focus in on that one little leaf, there was another interruption. And uh, someone came with a need, and he would help this person, help this person. He comes to the end of his life, and there, there are only a few leaves that are done absolutely beautifully, but the rest of the canvas is blank. And he's like, he, 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 he finishes his life feeling like he didn't accomplish anything. <laughs> and he gets to heaven, and all of a sudden, there's this beautiful canvas that was inside of him, and he really wanted to finish that. And he sees in heaven that every time you gave a cup of water in my name, every time you helped someone in need, every time that, that you took a hit for my name, that you were willing to forgive, that you were willing to help, that you were willing to love someone, every time this canvas is being completed. And look at, look at the volume over the years of what has been accomplished here. And I think some of you are discouraged today, and you're saying, Man, like I don't feel like, like the investment has been worth it. And you, you, you take a slice of right now and you forget the years of things that God has been doing through your life every step of the way. And you say it's unfinished, it's unfinished. And God is saying if you were faithful over this little that I've entrusted to you here, <laughs> I'm going to place you over much. What does that mean? <laughs> Here's what it means. Listen, CFC. This life here is just this little vapor short. This is nothing. All this is is the question, are you going to be faithful to me or not? And then for those who are faithful, God is actually going to allow you to reign with Christ, and you're going to be entrusted with his kingdom in the future with much, not little like down here, with much. And you'll have the excitement of being creative and productive in God's next world. So this world was really just 
a, a little preparation for eternity. Can I, can I entrust you with something? God doesn't need us, right? He's just kind of testing us. And then for eternity, we have this opportunity to invest in a place that's going to be mind-blowing. Enter the joy of your master. What is the joy of your master? <laughs> to, to live and rule over creation in a new world. There's no sin, no suffering. There's deep satisfaction for that inner void. There's no more curse, no more thorns, no more frustration, no battling my flesh, the world, the devil. I'm no, uh, the more I invest, the more excitement uh, builds over time. And so I can be investing now. The Apostle Paul said it this way. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. There's laid up for me in store this crown for me, but not for me only, but also for those who love his appearing. I want to tell you, the more you've lived month after month and year after year and invested, taken hits, sacrificed, struggled, right? The more this excitement grows in you that you're, you love the idea of his appearing. You're excited about him to appear. And the differentiation is, are you investing because of things that you want for yourself or are you thinking about his kingdom? That, that's the differentiation. I want to close with this, um, this um, verse 24, the, the idea of the missed opportunity. Because I'm concerned as your pastor that, um, that it wouldn't be fair for you to go to heaven and feel like you've been mistaught or we haven't been upfront with you or upright with what does God's kingdom look like. And so I just have to put out a stark warning. My concern is if, you're, if you've been investing in God's kingdom and you're discouraged tonight, I believe God wants to encourage you with the idea of production. But I also need to warn, some of you might say, I come to church or whatever, if there's not actual production and fruit, my concern is that if there's no fruit, that you're not really born again, and you've, you've sort of missed it, and you're going to be shocked in the end. And so that's why we have to go through this next passage here. Verse 24, he also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And so I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. So what's interesting is this guy was one of the servants. He's part of the estate. Um, he's in the estate. He says he's a servant, but he did nothing to invest for the master and the question is why? Why did he not invest? And this is, as I've read what, he probably had a speech prepared, you know, this guy's on a delay and I have my little speech prepared for when he comes back. I think the real reason he didn't, he didn't invest is because he didn't really know the master. I mean, intellectually he knew there's a master there, but he didn't really know the master. He didn't really know him. And the reason I believe that is because he says to him, you're a hard man. I knew you were a hard man. Well, we know about Christ <laughs> that he's actually slow to anger and abounding in love. He's actually very patient and gracious. That's not who Jesus is. Jesus isn't a hard man. Religion is hard. <laughs> so maybe this guy was just religious and he's like, oh man, I can't fulfill all the laws. Or maybe he was just stuck in a religion. Jesus is not a hard man. So I don't think he really knew Jesus. Secondly, you reap where you did not sow. So now it's almost like this little jab, like, uh, like the oppressor, oppressed thing. Like, uh, like you, you really are the owner and you reap all kinds of benefit when you haven't sown. When actually in that culture, you would have uh, landowners, who, they'd own land and then they would, that was their investment and they would have other people reap and they gain some benefit and they give them some benefit. But it's like a little bit of a, a jab here. You're a hard man. You reap what you haven't sown, Right? Again, a little indicator, he may not really know the master because if you really knew Jesus, you would know, I lay down my life for my sheep. Jesus isn't some hard-nosed oppressor owner <laughs> who just takes advantage of people. Jesus has proven himself to lay down his life and take on unprecedented suffering on the cross for his children. So I don't know that this guy really knew the owner. And then the third thing he says is, well, I was really afraid. And in my opinion, it's baseless fear. 
It's baseless fear. Because the fear didn't really cripple him. It was his lack of, of faith. It's like he hid his talent. Someone could have received the Holy Spirit and become productive in God's world, but chose not to. He did not know God. I believe he didn't know God. And he, he put out there, well, I was afraid that, that, that you're a hard master. And so watch what happens in verse 26. We'll continue here. His master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. And then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my um, coming, I should have um, received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. It's, it's a little shocking. He says, you wicked and slothful. Um, and so the question is, was it really f- fear that he didn't invest? Or was that just an excuse? Because what, what the master says is, if you're really so afraid, at least go to the bank and put the money in the bank. You could get a little bit of interest. Was it really fear? I don't think it was fear. So he says, you wicked, meaning you make excuses and then you blame the master for being hard. But secondly, you chose not to be productive because you were what? You were just downright lazy. Like you were, you were lazy. You chose, you received what the master gave and then you chose not to invest. What a wasted opportunity. I, I wonder if, if there are people who live in an environment of God's saving grace and, and, and you don't allow the grace of God to trickle down and understand what, how grateful you should be for that. And instead, you're playing this game and actually not investing in the kingdom of heaven. And so we, we find the outcome in verse 29. To everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and Cast the worth, worthless servant into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I, I wonder if he's not talking about the Holy Spirit, that the one who has the Holy Spirit, it actually compounds on itself, and you have more and more opportunity to invest in love and to serve. The one who does not have the Spirit, since you don't really know God, and you don't have his Spirit, there's no productivity for the good of others um, you, you couldn't even be in heaven because heaven is a place where there are people who are producing blessing and joy. <laughs> and you proved yourself over here that you are not one of the stewards that's going to be actually doing the big stuff in heaven one day. And so it filters itself out between the wheat and the tares. All right, let's pray together. Lord, I just want to thank you today for... Um, the awe of production that you would invite us in in to be a part of um, of your kingdom that we can produce physical blessing that we can produce spiritual blessing thank you that your holy spirit helps us to do that and lord we want to I just would ask that if there are some in the room today who feel discouraged, that you would just encourage us, Lord, that that you see every single act of service. You see every single investment, and it doesn't go to waste. I pray that your spirit would just encourage hearts to know that it's worth it. But then, Lord, if there are some of us who maybe we have become distracted and we're not really investing in the kingdom of heaven, some very sobering words here, God. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you. Um, That there's just this sense of saying, um, boy, I want to be ready for the return of Christ and have I really been investing and taking risks or am I just doing my own thing? And so, Lord, I just pray that you would um, help us as a church body to be able to um, be in a place where we're just producing fruit 
that your spirit would just be working powerfully through us. And we ask that you guide us in that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to take a few moments to um, uh, share in a worship song. Abby is going to lead us in this. And then right after that, there will be two questions of reflection for you. And then we'll kind of have a little bit of time to, to lead through and process some of what we've heard tonight. Let's stand and respond together, church.
So you can have a seat here for a minute as we just continue to reflect on the message this evening. Just take some time in silence here. Lord, we pray for just a keen insight into the times that we live in and the idea of being ready for your return, to have no regrets, no regrets. And I pray that you just clarify, maybe there's a next step, just a next step, something that your spirit is indicating in our hearts right now. I'm a steward. I've been entrusted. Um, Your return could be at any moment, and I just want to make sure that that I'm ready. So, Lord, I just pray that when that time comes, we wouldn't look back and feel like we've missed it. that we've been in step with you, God. Thank you. Thank you for your love in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When you came in today, I think Christina handed you um, the elements for communion. And this um, this is something that Christians are encouraged to do, and I believe that this can really be helpful in, um, in moving forward in this. Is when we understand the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross, what he did for us, that's what motivates us. It's not guilt or shame or... It's this supernatural thing that motivates us that is just released when we understand the depth of the gospel. So if you take that foil off the top, that thin foil, there's a wafer there. This represents the body of Christ that was broken for you. So just take a few moments to quietly... Pray and just thank him for what he did for you on the cross and that his body was broken, that he did sacrifice himself for you. So just take a moment quietly and just thank him for what he did for you.
Lord, thank you that you could have found other solutions to our problem, but you chose to demonstrate your love for us by laying down your life. And we thank you for that today, and we understand um, what you've done, and we just uh, we worship you and praise you for that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the bread together. Let me pray with you, and then we'll take the cup as well. So, Lord, thank you for the blood of Jesus, and there's so much power in that. I just pray that if there are some in the room or watching who are stuck in shame and guilt, guilt for something they might have done wrong, and shame of identifying as, as uh, being defeated or bad, that Satan as the accuser wants to crush us. I just want to thank you that you have broken the guilt and the shame and that you have, um, by your blood being shed on the cross, released for us um, from being in slavery and you've given us freedom. And so we thank you tonight for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us and that sets us free. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take the cup together. All right, let's uh, stand one last time and close together in song and in worship. And just asking Christ, asking God that Christ would be magnified in us. Let's stand together. Be mad. 
God, that you would be honored and glorified in how we live our lives. God, the things we say, the things we do, God, that we would just seek to honor you and give you glory. God, that others would see Christ in and through us. God, especially now in a world that just seems to be tearing apart. Every time we flip on the news, every time we talk to a friend who's hurting or broken or going through something difficult, God, And may you just use us, Lord, in the places that you have us. May we just have a grateful heart for what you've given us. Got the different talents, got the different skills, got these different personalities. God, they all have purpose in our place where you put us. So God, May Christ be magnified in us. It's in his name that we sing and we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us uh, tonight, and thanks for joining us at home this weekend. Just pray that you would have a wonderful and safe weekend, um, and enjoy the snow. Take care. Oh, we're going to close with this verse. I almost forgot. This is what happens when I'm playing piano and I'm not looking this way. Um, let's close with this last verse tonight out of 1 John. And now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Amen. Take care. Tears fall.